Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Unquestionably the most controversial name in 2019 Many people love him Others hate him The example of Muhammad is, you know, as, a, as just an exemplar of the faith He was a, a warlord Who is the man behind the name? And more importantly is he really a true prophet sent by God? This is the hot seat. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amma ba'd. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce you to a brand new show and a brand new podcast called The Hot Seat. To understand a little bit more about the hot seat, we first have to understand the context of the modern day world we find ourselves living in, in the year 2019. It is a world in which perhaps, perhaps there are more doubts, misconceptions and misinterpretations that are thrown around about the religion of Islam than in any other period of time in the history of mankind. The internet is a number one source used by people globally to acquire information on any topic and it is riddled and full of false notions and erroneous ideologies about the deen of Allah Our kids, ourselves, are being exposed to this kind of information on a daily, and if not daily, then at the very least weekly basis. And whether we know it or not, whether we choose to accept it or not, it is having an effect on ourselves, our hearts, our minds, and ultimately our understanding of this beautiful religion. To further complicate the problem, many of us find ourselves living in Western societies where the governments and the social norms and pressures are constantly trying to redefine what is good and what is bad, what is accepted and what is rejected, what Islam is and is allowed to be and what Islam is never allowed to be. All of this, my brothers and sisters, ultimately leads to confusion, it leads to ignorance and if Allah permits it can lead to misguidance. The hot seat has therefore been designed with the permission of Allah alone to counter these kind of modern day contemporary issues head on by using the knowledge and the guidance of the Muslims of the past, the early generations of Muslims, the best of generations. There's not a single Muslim on the face of the planet today that would doubt the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed our religion for us over 1400 years ago and that that completed, holistic, perfect religion is just as applicable now in the year 2019 as it was back then. We truly do have classical solutions for contemporary problems. However, this isn't your normal average Islamic lecture series. First of all, it's not a lecture, it's a discussion between two parties, often opposing parties, in an attempt to reach the truth, bi'idnillah. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it's a unique, one-of-its-kind interactive podcast where you, from the comfort of your own home, have the opportunity to vote for and to choose the topic we'll be discussing on the show. You also have the chance to ask your own questions on these contemporary issues and to grill the speaker if you feel like he hasn't been grilled enough on the show itself. I'll be releasing details of how you can do both of those things at the end of this episode. But for now, without any further ado, let's get into this episode of The Hot Seat. وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبْ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ I'm once again joined on the hot seat by Ustad Abdul Rahman, Hafidhullah. Ustad, how are you doing today? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing good, alhamdulillah. The votes have been counted once again. Uh, on the website, we had another three options, and the public have voted for the topic Was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a false prophet? So that's the issue that we're going to be discussing today. And as always, I want to start with an opening question. As we're talking about prophethood, I want to talk about the concept of prophethood before we move on to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What makes somebody a prophet? Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, lahu alhamdul hasan, wa thanaa ul jameel, wa shadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, 
يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد When it comes to talking about the issue of a prophet the scholars they mention that there are four things that a person has to agree or acknowledge and without these four uh, the concept of prophecy or prophethood cannot be really discussed properly the first thing that we need to uh, affirm and ex- accept is المخبر المنبئ المرسل the one who sent this prophet the one who is the message is being conveyed from and that is Allah Azza wa Jalla so the person has to believe in Allah he can't be an atheist and talk about a nubu'a uh, prophethood. The second thing that needs to be accepted also is al mukhbar al mumba, the one that was sent, and that's the prophet, and that's our discussion today. The third one is al madmoon al nubu'a. What does the prophecy contain? What's it talking about? The message, basically. Uh, so it, the first one is Allah Azza wa Jalla. The second one is the messenger, and the third one is the message itself. Uh, so the Sharia and the legislations that he's going to come with, and the fourth one is the intermediary, al wasita, the intermediary. The intermediary uh, can sometimes be directly with Allah Azza wa Jalla, so there's no one in between Allah and the Prophet. And sometimes there is the uh, angel uh, Jibril, who is an intermediary between Allah and the uh, Messenger. So those are the four pillars of when it comes to discussing prophethood, as. The scholars of Ahlul Sunnah mention a prophet is not something a person can come with by effort and hard work. Hmm. You, you can't pray so much ibadat and worship Allah a lot and come with good deeds and then reach prophethood. Like you can reach uh, righteousness and uh, piety. Prophethood is not attained by hard work. It's a gift from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah chooses who he wants to make the prophet. As Allah said in the ayah, Allah knows where he's going to place this message and who is he going to give it to. And so Abdullah ibn Mas'udin said, Inna Allah, nadara ila ibadihi. Allah looked at the heart of his creation and he chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all the other prophets from amongst their people. So they were chosen, they were selected, they were picked by Allah azza wa jalla. Also what we believe is that prophets are male, not females. Uh, there are some scholars who took a strange opinion an obscure opinion, and it's a fringe, it's not the mainstream belief that a female can be a prophet. Those three scholars are uh, Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, and also Al Imam Al Qurtubi, rahimahullah, and also Ibn Hazm. These three scholars, they said that a female can be a prophet, and they specifically mentioned uh, the mother of uh, uh, Musa, alayhi salam, because Allah said in the ayah, wa awhayna ila ummi Musa an ardi'i, you know, wa awhayna ila ummi Musa. We sent a wahi on the mother of Musa. So they said, look, she's a prophet. But here it meant al-ilham. Allah directed her to do this particular thing. But that wasn't a revelation. And the mother of Isa ibn Maryam, they said that Jibreel came to her. And so this is what a prophet is, right? Jibreel comes to. Mm. But the scholars, they responded to that, that the prophet is a male, not a female. Uh, So summarized and quick. This is what a prophet is. Okay. So essentially we're talking about Allah, the creator, speaking to a human being, whether directly or indirectly. Why do you even feel like this is possible in the first place? So the concept of um, the adilla, the evidence is, and I, I really want to focus on the rational evidence. I want to focus on the rational evidences that uh, there can be a prophet. Before we even say Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a prophet from Allah, let's first of all prove that there can be a prophet. So, inshallah ta'ala, there are five uh, ways to prove. There are many more, but just five for this podcast that there can be a prophet. Okay. That a, there is a rational argument for the plausibility of a prophet. The first one is Dalilul Khalqi wal Qudrati wa Qiyasul Awla. Allah created subhanahu wa ta'ala. And creating is more complicated and hard, but nothing is hard for Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's more complicated. But for Allah, there's nothing complicated or hard. If He's done that, 
then sending a prophet and a messenger is nothing hard to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very easy. As Allah said in the ayah, وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ Allah is the one who creates and then he's the one who chooses. Mm. So Allah chooses who he wants to make a prophet. Allah chooses how this universe and this world is run. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another ayah, Allah says, رَفِيعُ الدَّرَجَاتِ ذُو الْعَرْشِ يُلْقِ الرُّوحَ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ Same, Allah created everything subhanahu wa ta'ala and he chose from his slaves a prophet. In another ayah, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, Allah knows. He has the power, he has the ability, he has the strength. He knows who he's going to give this message to. So, the first rational argument for there being a prophet is the fact that Allah created subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's, it's a logical absurdity that someone would put effort in something and nothing is effort for Allah azza wa But I'm just trying to give us a human... If someone went into the kitchen, we can't compare anything to Allah, but I'm just trying to bring the information close to the uh, mm-hmm. listeners. If someone went into the kitchen and they cooked food and they made food, and then as soon as they cooked it, they chose to just throw it into the bin. Mm. Or they just left it there and they walked away from it. And then the next day they came and they did the same. You'd say this person is insane. Why would you do this and then just get rid of it or just dismiss it or uh, not do anything with it? Allah is a great example. How is it possible that we say Allah wa ta'ala, He created His creation, He brought it to existence? Which brings me to my second point. Just before we move on to the second point, even though Allah has the ability and the power to send a prophet, it doesn't necessarily mean that He did. It doesn't make it true. Allah has the ability to do everything, yet He didn't do everything. There's certain things He did, certain things He doesn't do. I mean, Allah does everything, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and everything He can do, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't restrict Allah's ability. But that brings me to my second point which is dalilul inayat wal hikmah it goes against allah's wisdom subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will create this whole entire universe he will create the creation inside it and there won't be no aim and objective behind their creation allah says wa laqad ba'athna fi kulli ummatin rasulan an i'budullaha wajtanibut taghut like we sent amongst every nation in every people a messenger worship allah alone and stay away from associating partners with him in another ayah allah says ayahsabul insanu an yutraka suda did mankind actually think and assume that he would be left aimlessly, no purpose, nothing behind his creation? creation? So it's wisdom that it's the wisdom from the wisdoms of Allah Azza wa Jalla that He created us for a purpose. In another ayah, Allah says, abatha? Did you think that we created you for a joke? That we just created you for nothing? The third argument for it uh, is Dalil al وَالْإِفْتِخَارِ وَالْحَاجَةِ That we are in need of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are hungry, we need to know our Creator. We want to know this world that we're in, who brought us here. Mm. There's that haja and that hunger inside us that makes us uh, want to know who our Creator is. So you're, you're in front of two paths, not a third. The first one is to say Allah wa ta'ala, He did not clarify anything to us. To say, إِمَّا أَنْ يَتْرُكَ النَّاسَ Allah leaves the people subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and he doesn't clarify to them the path to him he just creates them and he doesn't make a path for them or you come to the second one which is you say Allah, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala Allah clarified the path for them he, gave, he clarified the path to him in the most clearest and the most uh, apparent manner there could be he clarified everything for us those are the two you have why do you feel like this is a proof for i'm not sure i'm making the connection why you feel this is a proof for prophethood okay allah created us and he from his wisdom he creates us for a purpose i'm with you on that and he would tell us what that purpose is but do you not believe in the concept of the fitrah that we already know without having a messenger sent to us what is right and what is wrong the scholars they categorize the fitrah into two fitrah to tadayun the fitrah of wanting to have a religion. It's in us all. It's something Allah placed inside every one of us that we want to have a religion. We want to be slaves to Allah Azza wa Jalla. We want that ultimate creator, that divine being that we will go back to. It's placed inside us. Allah said in the ayah, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ Hanifa. Turn yourself to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then look what Allah said, he said, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبَدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّا
See, the beginning of the ayah, Allah said, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا Turn yourself to Allah. And then Allah mentioned the concept, which is the fitrah. I was watching a um, debate that took place between the militant atheist, uh, Richard Dawkins. And the debate was between him and John Lennox. It's, if you go to YouTube and you, watch, you, you type in the Fixed Point Foundation, I think it's called. And the debate is on the God delusion that Richard Dawkins wrote. And subhanAllah, the debate, when it, before it unravels and the discussion starts, Richard Dawkins says something that, subhanAllah, it really shocked me. He said, When you consider the beauty of the world and you wonder how it came to be what it is, you are naturally overwhelmed with a feeling of awe, a feeling of admiration, and you almost feel a desire to worship something. I feel this. Uh, I recognize that other scientists, such as Carl Sagan, feel this. Einstein felt it. We all of us share a kind of religious reverence for the beauties of the universe, for the complexity of life, for the uh, sheer magnitude of the cosmos, the sheer magnitude of geological time. And it's tempting to translate that feeling of awe and worship into a desire to worship some particular thing, a, a person, an, an agent. You want to attribute it to a maker, to a creator. That's fitrah. Mm. That's the fitrah that Allah is referring to here. That you want a religion. You want to believe in your Lord. The second type is fitriyatu tahsini wa taqbih. You see, the concept of evil and good. Mm -hmm. There is a universal good yeah. that we all know. Before legislation came, we all know lying is bad. We all know killing and uh, oppressing another person is bad. That's innately built in us. That's, that's there. But when it comes to the detailed types of good, okay, that cannot be attained except through what? Through legislation. That's the fitriyah that Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah called it, tahsin wa taqbih. And that is why Allah said in the ayah, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هَدَانَا لِهَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ لَقَدْ جَاءَتْ رُسُلُ رَبِّنَا بِالْحَقِّ What does that translate to? It means, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ They said, praise to Allah Azza wa Jalla, the one who guided us to the good. وَمَا كُنَّا We were not once to be guided if Allah did not guide us. And look what they said after that, لَقَدْ جَاءَتْ رُسُلُ رَبِّنَا بِالْحَقِّ the messengers that came from our Lord have truly told us the truth. So this is the fitrah that's here is that the prophets are pushing them to what is good and telling them to stay away from that which is evil. And also you know the ayah where Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعَقِلُوا مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ before that Allah says تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْذُ كُلَّ مَا أُلْقِيَ فِيهَا فَوْجٌ سَأَلَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَذِيرٌ قَالُوا بَلَا قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٍ وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ So if we only listened gives a summary of that sorry just give it the, the concept here is that they say that if we listened when the messengers were telling us what was good from what is bad and we we gave our ear and our heart and our mind we would not have been in the hellfire. So yes, the fitrah is also another evidence that the prophets exist. Um, also another thing that, uh, it's a strong evidence to prove that there, the possibility of a prophet, the possibility yeah. of a prophet, is the concept of Allah wa Taala's justice. Allah can't just create us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and when he brings us to this universe, he punishes us the day of judgment without having to send on to us a prophet. This goes against Allah's justice, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We are ones who won't punish them unless we send a messenger for, for them. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be more just for Allah just to speak to all of us directly? I mean, he had the ability to do that, right? He did, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's the concept of the fitrah, right? The fitrah is already some, uh, something that's already placed inside you. It's there already. Even the detailed aspects of good and bad, why couldn't you have just spoken to us directly? Why, do, why, mean, is it, why is it conditioned for us to believe in a man to attain salvation? Why can't we just believe in God? Um, as I said at the beginning of the ayah, وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ مَا كَانَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةِ We have no choice. Allah, Taala, لا يُسْأَلُ عَمَّا يَفْعَلُهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ 
Allah has never questioned why he does what he does. He does it because of wisdom that he knows that we don't know necessarily, subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, we only have the pixel, and Allah has the whole picture. So we don't really understand the intrinsic of issues and matters. But going back to the point I was saying, Allah's justice, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how fair he is, is that he can't punish us the day of judgment without, have, without sending us a messenger and a prophet to guide us. And Allah said in another ayah, وَمَا أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا لَهَا مُنْذِرُونَ ذِكْرًا وَمَا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ Allah said that there was no nation or no village or no town that we destroyed except there was a warner that came to them to warn them. Uh, Allah says, وَمَا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ We were not oppressors. We're just. In another ayah, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, رُسُلًا مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ Prophets. What did the prophets do? Two things. They glad tidings and those prophets, they warn. And then Allah says, لِأَلَّا يَكُونَ لِلنَّاسِ عَلَى اللَّهِ حُجَّةٌ بَعْدَ الرُّسُلِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حكيما. Allah sends messengers with two things. They warn and they give glad tidings. And then Allah wa ta'ala, he says, So we don't have no proof after the prophets and the messengers come. There's no proof for us. That's it. Everything was clarified to us. And final verse that I want to mention is, Allah says in another ayah, وَلَوْ أَنَّا أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِهِ لَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا لَوْ لَا أَرْسَلْتَ إِلَيْنَا رَسُولًا فَنَتَّبِعَ آيَاتِكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنَّ ذِلَّ وَنَخْزَى They say, وَلَوْ أَنَّا أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ Allah says, if we were to destroy them with our punishment before we sent a messenger to them, they would have said, oh Allah, why didn't you send a messenger to us? They would have said, oh Allah, why did you not send a messenger to us? So we can follow the things that he calls us to and that we can stay away or we can be saved from any humiliation and destruction. Those are the points that prove the possibility of a prophet. Final one, just a final one, okay. is <clears throat> historically prophets came. The Ibn Maryam is historically proven that he came. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Historically prophets came and this is an evidence of the possibility of prophets. So it's not like something that didn't happen. It's actually something that did happen. When the disbelievers, Quraysh, the Arab pagans, they tried to dismiss that because they knew that if they, tr if they proved that there never came a prophet before, that they could probably put a question mark under the Prophet. Mm -hmm. So this is what they said. That we've never heard of this in the previous religions, in the previous nations. We've never heard this before. This is made up. And then Allah responded to them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said to them, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهِ حَقَّ قَدْرِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّن شَيْءٍ قُلْ مَنْ أَنزَلَ الْكِتَابَ الَّذِي جَاءَ بِهِ مُوسَى نُورًا وَهُدًا لِلنَّاسِ تَجْعَلُونَهُ قَرَاطِيسًا تُبْدُونَهَا وَتُخْفُونَ كَثِيرًا وَعُلِّمْتُمْ مَا لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا أَنتُمْ وَلَا آبَاؤُكُمْ إِلَى آخِرِ الْآيَةِ Allah says, who is the one who sent on Musa the book? And this is historically taken place. It has actually happened. So these five that I just mentioned, and quickly going to go over what those five are. The first evidence to show the rational evidence to prove the, the plausibility of there being a prophet is number one, Dalilul Khalqi wal Qudrati wa Qiyasil Awla. Allah created and He has the ability, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I gave the evidences for that. The second one is Dalilul Inayat wal Hikmah, Allah's consideration and His wisdom for His creation. Number three, Dalilul Darurati wal Hajat wal Iftiqar, the need that we have to for Allah Azza wa Jalla. We need to know our Creator. We are in hunger to know who He is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, Dalilul Adl ilahi Allah's justice, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He doesn't punish His creation without, without sending them a prophet. And the fifth one is Dalilul Istiqra al Tariqi. Historically, we know there came prophets before us that have walked on the face of this earth. Okay, before we move on, I've got a few questions on those five. The fourth one you mentioned is Allah's justice. What do we believe about the prophets? Do we believe that they are guaranteed paradise? Yeah, prophets are promised paradise. So now you have someone who, like you said, didn't work f hard actions to attain the status of prophethood. Rather, they were chosen by Allah. And this person gets a free ticket into paradise, whereas we have to work for our ticket into paradise? How is that fair? Prophets is not a gift. Prophecy is not a gift. Prophecy is not a gift, meaning it's something Allah Azza wa Jalla gives it to whoever He wishes. Like in working for Jannah, it's something that everybody has to come with. Working for Jannah, it's something that everyone has to come with. 
everyone exerts their effort towards. The only issue, the only thing is, prophets will always be ones that work for Jannah. They will always do that. It won't happen a prophet who will what not work for Jannah and not put in the efforts. And rather, prophets get it even harder than the other ordinary creation. Meaning, there are things that were obligatory on our prophet that weren't obligatory on his creation. Uh, that he has he had to do that we don't have to do because of his station and his position. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, the other question. Wait, that's not the only person we believe that's going to enter Jannah, of course. We know other creations of Allah who were alive and they were informed that they were going to go to Jannah as well, which weren't prophets. No. The second question I want to ask is I get the impression that your main argument is for the, for the reason why Allah sent prophets is to teach us our religion. Mm. You mentioned that we don't have any female prophets. This is a stronger opinion, the opinion that you hold. Are you of the belief that men and women have been created the same? If not, because I don't believe you think that. If not, then how do women know how to live their lives? I understand that male prophets were sent to teach men how to live their life. <laughs> Aren't women different? And if they are, then why weren't there any female prophets to show them how to live their life? You see, the, the difference between men and women is the biological side of it. But the spiritual side, if a woman does a righteous action and a man does a righteous action, in the eyes of Allah, Azzawajal, it's the same. It's the intention and the hard work and the, the, the way that they do it in accordance to the sunnah. That's what's looked at, not their gender. But biologically, I'm not the only one who believes that. A feminist will say the same, of course. A biologically, men and women are not the same. And so Allah doesn't want to, subhanahu wa ta'ala, from his wisdom, it's to pressure and put this burden on women. Women have times within the month that they can't, uh, handle these responsibilities where she will not be praying the salah and the people need an imam to lead them for the prayer and many other things so you see what we have to understand is the relationship between and I always say this the relationship between the creating and the legislation Allah Taala's legislations are always in accordance to the agenda of the person and their ability and their you know their capability it's not the legislation, it observes that. Because no one can observe the, the laws that are passed on you except one who knows you greatly. And that's only Allah Azza wa Jalla. No. Okay, I think you made a strong claim for the reason why prophethood in general can exist and the proofs for that. I'd now like to take the conversation specifically to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we know, and you mentioned at the end that there were many prophets that have come in history, we've also been told that there have been false prophets in the past or people who claim prophethood. And in the future as well, there's going to be people who claim prophethood. How do we know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not one of these people? Okay, Sahih, it's very good now. Now I, I have to prove and give a strong argument for Al-Barhanatu ala Sidqul Nubu'atin Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The evidences and the proofs for Nabiullah Muhammad being a prophet from Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is after I've proven that the possibility and the plausibility of there being a prophet. Mm -hmm. uh, there are eight points I can mention if the podcast allows me to go through each and every one of them. That's good. If not, then inshallah ta'ala, uh, I might do another session on it. The first one is, Dalalat ittisaf in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bi kamal al-akhlaqi ala nubu'ati. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's characteristics and who he was as an individual, is an evidence that he was a prophet from Allah. And mm -hmm. there are many attributes and characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ that point towards him being a prophet. But I'm going to stick to the most important one for the podcast. And that is, he had kamal al-sidq. He was completely truthful, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I want to prove this concept of him being truthful from two angles. And number one, I want to mention that he was completely truthful and the imp impossibility or that it's it's impossible for him to be ever be to ever have lied or to be a liar. Okay. Those are the two angles I want to tackle this from. Let's first of all look at what the people who were most closest said to him. Not his followers, not his disciples, not his companions. I'm talking about his staunch enemies. I'm talking about his staunch enemy who enemies who lived close to him, who were looking for any reason to not believe in him. What did they say about him? Quraysh when they saw Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he even addressed them and he spoke to them and he preached to them they said to him ma jarrabna alayka illa sidqa another riwayah says ma jarrabna alayka kadiba 
أما ما جربنا عليك إلا صدقة أنا نظري وايس ما جربنا عليك كذبا محمد we've never known you to lie it's one thing we've never known you to lie ولذلك أبو طالب the prophet's uncle he has a poetry in where he praised the prophet called لامية أبو طالب he said لقد علموا أن ابننا لا مكذب لدينا ولا يعنى بقول الأباطل our son is known it's, it's, it's affirmed that he's not one to lie and I'll tell you something very shocking that I came across that proves his honesty and his truthfulness alayhi salatu uh, uh, the battle of Badr when it happened uh, Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiqin and Abu Jahl came together this is when the two armies met one another the Prophet Asim's army is on the other side of Quraysh and Quraysh is on the other side they're facing one another Akhnas ibn Shuraiqin he said to Abu Jahl when the two armies saw one another he said to him Atara anna Muhammadan yakdibu do you think Muhammad lies? These are two non-Muslims. Mm-hmm. They're looking at one another. They're, this is the battle they're standing in. They're getting ready for the Prophet فقال أبو جهل أبو جهل said, كيف يكذب على الله وقد كنا نسميه الأمين? How would he lie about Allah when we used to see him as the truthful one? لأنه ما كذب قط. And the reason why we called him the truthful one is he's never lied to us. This is the Prophet. So this is a testimony from a man who wants to wage war with him now. He's going to fight with him. He's in the front row. Of, and everyone who read the history would know Abu Jahl was the one who f- pushed the battle of Badr. Another example I want to give you from the people of the scripture. A Jew man. Quraysh is his people, right? Who knew him. 40 years before he became a prophet, Allah wanted them to get to know Muhammad. The name they gave him was Muhammad al-Amin. That was his name. The second uh, point I want to bring is a Jew man, Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam, he said, لقد, لقد, he said, لما قدم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المدينة, when the messenger came to the city of Medina, in جفل الناس إليه. The people, they rushed to him. They wanted to see him. وقيل قدم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فجئت في الناس لأنظر إليه. Abdullah ibn Salam, he said, I rushed to him so I can see him. I wanted to know him. I wanted to get to see who this man is. Because I've heard about him. I want to know who Muhammad is. So that he said, I came. فلما استث... when I looked and I observed and I, and I got the chance to look at his face when I looked at his face I realized this is not a face of a liar and the first thing that he said I heard him say was أيها الناس أفشوا السلام وأطعموا الطعام وصلوا والناس نيام تدخل الجنة بسلام First thing I heard him say was, spread the greetings. Again, he came to Medina. Jews are living next to him. Uh, look at his character, alayhi salatu wasalam, and his, and his, his morality. He didn't say fight. He didn't say wage war. He said, spread the greetings. Give food. And pray Pray whilst the people are sleeping. You will enter Jannah in safety and peace. So these are the people who was close, most closest to him that said that he was truthful. If Nabiullah Muhammad now, and I want to go to the second part, which is that he w- it was impossible for him to lie. Because if he was a liar, mm-hmm. and he lied about Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allah made a covenant and an oath that he will destroy anyone who lies. Allah wa Ta'ala, he said in the ayah, وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ If Muhammad was to forge things against us and he was to make it up, لَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُ بِالْيَمِينِ We've grabbed him. Allah is saying, ثُمَّ لَقَطَعْنَا مِنْهُ الْوَتِينَ we will destroy him and he humiliate him and annihilate him. In another place, Allah says, وَإِن كَادُوا لَيَفْتِنُونَكَ عَنِ الَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ لِتَفْتَرِي عَلَيْنَا غَيْرَهُ وَإِذَا لَتَّخَذُوكَ خَلِيلًا وَلَوْ لَا أَنْ ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِتَّ تَرْكَرُوا إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا إِذَا لَأَذَقْنَاكَ ضِعْفَ الْحَيَاةِ وَضِعْفَ الْمَمَاتِ ثُمَّ لَا تَجِدُ لَكَ عَلَيْنَا نصيرا. That you were they wanted to come to you, Muhammad, and try to get you away from the legislation that was sent onto you. They were trying to sway you away if you did go their direction and you followed them and you did what they wanted and you distorted our religion, we would have destroyed you, Muhammad, and you would never find anyone help you and aid you. So he couldn't have lied. It's impossible for him to lie, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How could he then be a liar, alayhi salatu wasalam, when he was saddened for his people? Whenever his people didn't follow him, he would be sad, emotional about it. Allah said in the ayah, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِمْ إِلَّمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفًا When they did not believe in your message, Muhammad, you were close to 
sacrificing yourself so they can believe. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah said in another ayah, فَلَا تَدْهَبْ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتِ Don't let your nafs go in regret and sorrow, sadness because they're not believing in you. So all of the people at his time, obviously they believed him to be a truthful one. They all accepted the religion then? Um, the people that came in, uh, in contact with the Prophet no, 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 they didn't all believe him. They exactly. Were, they rejected his message. They didn't want to take it from him. But the rejection of the Prophet's message had to do with something else. It had nothing to do with him not being truthful or him not being honest. Why was it that they didn't want to take the Prophet's message? What was the reason? One of the reasons is hasad, a jealousy towards him. Allah said in the ayah, لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارٌ حَسَدًا مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ That the Ahlul Kitab, they wanted you to turn away from your belief and your faith and not become believers. Why? حَسَدًا مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ They had jealousy in their heart towards you. So they had jealousy to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It had nothing to do with the concept that he was a liar alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay, let's go on to your second point that you want to bring. The second point that I want to mention is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was an ummi. He was illiterate alayhi salatu wasallam. He was illiterate. He couldn't read, nor could he write. Okay. And I want to prove this from two angles: al adilla al aqliya. Rationally, it makes sense that he was illiterate. Why? Because he was from a land and a people who were known to be illiterate historically. The Arabs they were not known to be readers or writers. They were known for memory, and hifd and memorization. So that's a rational evidence, proof to show that it makes sense. He was in the middle of the desert. There were some who could write though. Very little. And they were pointed out those writers. They were known. The words people who wrote. Waraqat ibn Nawfal was a writer. And he could read. And he could read the previous scriptures. But even if you look at the narrations that came regarding him, it would state and it categorically mentions that he was a reader. Because it was a unique characteristic. Not many people could do that. And Allah mentioned that the Prophet was illiterate in the Quran. And Ummi is the one who is illiterate. He couldn't read nor write. The second evidence to show is the ayah that I just mentioned. So there was a textual evidence I gave you, which is And the fact that it was a uh, it was a historical reality because if you go back and you look at the time of the messenger والسلام, you realize that the Arabs they focused on memorization not reading or writing they didn't author let's go back to the ayah you mentioned <laughs> what does this translate to so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sent down amongst the illiterate amongst the illiterate as a plural um, him including so, but the, he's really talking about not just he didn't just mention that the prophet mm. himself is a literate mm. ummiyin is a plural right Sahih. so he's talking about the people at the time that which were which is illiterate. my argument at the beginning that which is your, uh, yes the, the, they were arabs were illiterate they couldn't read majority of them couldn't read or write now do we have any proof that him himself Textual proof mm -hmm. that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. Yeah. We're talking about the condition of the people. Him Allah himself. says, "Nabi al ummi alladhi yajiduna maktub." Allah says, "Nabi al ummi, the literate prophet." Okay, why does this, him being a literate prove his prophecy? Because he came with something Arabs were shocked with. Wa in kuntum fi raibi mimma nazzalna ala abdina, fatu bi surat min mitri wa dhu shuhadakum min dunni la in kuntum sadiqin. He came with a miracle. He came with a Quran. That they were mind boggled, they were gobsmacked, they were shocked with what he brought. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Like, what is this? And that's another point I'm going to come to, inshallah, when I mm -hmm. speak about the Quranic miracle or the Quranic discourse and how the, the linguistic power in the Quran. Illiterate. All of this came. Not only that, he was an illiterate, so he couldn't read things before him how is he telling us which is another point I'm going to come to of the unseen and how could he talk about previous nations because he wasn't a reader if he read then he could have got those all from he could have gathered it from other places what about the argument that he was well travelled he worked with his first wife Khadija radiallahu anha in her business so he met different people and he inter interacted with Jews he interacted mm -hmm. with Christians and that's how we got to learn about the former scriptures about the former religions and cultures to say that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a traveler is actually a big mistake the reason i say that is because the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam never left the arabian peninsula only that he went to sham so he didn't travel much he only traveled to one place that was sham only 
No other place, alayhi salatu So that's a mistake that many people fall into. Number two is, the Prophet sallallahu came with detailed knowledge. He came with great detailed knowledge. That the information that he came with, alayhi salatu and that which he told us about, they were future events that were going to happen. Things that haven't, haven't even happened. That are going to happen, alayhi salatu And he told us things that have already happened in the past, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Let me just give you um, Some of the examples That he spoke about He told us about Nabilahi Isa He says وَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا تَأْكُلُونَ وَمَا تَدَّخِرُونَ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا آيَةً لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Isa ibn Maryam And how he uh, He would tell How he would tell uh, The people about What was stores, stored in their houses And what was there He told them Rather If you look at the Bible uh, Or the Christian scripture they don't, they don't have the historical events of Isa when he was young. So he couldn't got it from anywhere else. Mm. So something but, but there's no way of verifying whether this is actually true information if it's not anywhere else. But if everything else is true, then what, why would you say this isn't true? Because mm. everything else is accurate. What if there are some things that aren't accurate? Like, for example? Like, for example, in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Messenger وسلم, said, I and the last hour have been sent like this. And he joined the forefinger with the middle finger, mm. i.e. very, very close. And this is something quite common if you look at modern day false prophets like, sorry, false prophets like Joseph Smith from the Mormons. He claims that the end of the world is coming. Didn't the messenger fall into the same problem 1400 years later and we're still here? Okay, in another hadith, the Prophet he said, Man Anyone who dies, then death has, his day of judgment has come. So if you die, then that's it. And we know that the Ummah. As the Prophet said in another hadith, أَعْمَارُ أُمَّتِي مَا بَيْنَ سِتِينَ وَسَبْعِينَ وَقَلِيلُ مَنْ يَجُوزُ ذَلِكَ That the lifespan of my ummah is between 60 to 70 and little go overboard. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anyone who dies, that's the hours come. So He said, بُعْثُ أَنَا وَالسَّاعَةِ And I told you, the sa'a means the hour. The hour. Ha. The hour. He didn't say sa'akum or sa'atukum. In another hadith, he said, مَنْ مَا تَقَامَتْ قِيَامَتُ وَإِسَعَتُهُ Qiyam and sa'a is the same. Anyone who dies, his qiyam has happened. Because there's the questioning starting there from you, for you. You've now moved on to the next unit world, the next dimension, or the next place. Another thing is when he said this, alayhi salatu salam, which is another response, this doesn't say that it was a thousand years. If he did say a thousand years and it didn't happen, then you've mm -hmm. got a point. Okay. But when he did this, alayhi salatu salam, he means that as a prophet, compared to all of the previous prophets, my one is the closest when it comes to the hour. The hour is very close. But close, what do you mean? Hmm. How close are we talking about here? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he spoke about previous prophets, he mentioned them. Look for example when he spoke at Nabi Musa. He said, قَالَ لَا يَأْتِيكُمَا طَعَامٌ تُرْزَقَانِ إِلَّا نَبَأْتُكُمَا بِتَأْوِيلِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمَا ذَلِكُمَا مِمَّا عَلَّمَنِي رَبِّي Sorry, the story of Nabi Yusuf. He spoke about it. He even spoke about the Romans and the Persians when they were fighting. He already prophesied this. And he said, Alif la mim What does that mean? The Romans have been conquered. You see, alayhi salatu salam, he prophesied all this. And it happened. They mm -hmm. were fighting, no one knew. And the Romans won. The Romans won. Rather, Abu Bakr had a bet on this issue. He betted on it. And he beat the man he betted on. Because he heard it from the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam. Also, the Prophet, alayhi salam, he told, and this is one of the most shocking evidence that I've came across. Well, like, it really touched me, especially when I read it from Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah's Kitab al-Nubuwat, which is Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was alive and he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him whilst he was alive تَبَّتْ يَدَى أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبَّ مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَا لُوَ مَا كَسَبْ سَيَصْلَى نَارًا ذَاتَ لَهَبْ وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبْ فِي جِيدِهَا حَبْلٌ مِنْ مَسَدْ Abu, Abu Lahab He was told he's going to be in the hellfire while he was alive He could have disproven the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in all of it just by saying أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الله. He would have proven that the Prophet is a liar. He would have proved everything. But he became even more stubborn in his disbelief. Mm. Which just proved it even more that what? That he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was talking about something that's inevitably going inevitably to happen. Last evidence to show that he told things that were not going to happen. That, sorry, that, ha that haven't happened. He, he prophesied it before is when he talked about the conquering of Mecca. Allah said in the ayah, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ The ru'ya here was the, the wahi that was sent on him to tell him that he's going to conquer Mecca. So he prophesied things, things that he couldn't have 
actually known and they actually came to pass. It happened. The other thing that many prophets in the past bring is miracles. Did he come with any miracles? He did. He came with two miracles. The first miracle that he came with was he split the moon. As, al- the, uh, as the uh, hadith goes, سَأَلَ أَهْلُ مَكَّةَ أَنْ يُرِيَهُمْ آيَةِ The people of Mecca said, Muhammad, okay, show us something. And what he did was, فَأَرَاهُمْ إِنْشِقَاقَ الْقَمَرِ قَمَرِ فَأَرَاهُمْ إِنْشِقَاقَ الْقَمَرِ He showed them the splitting of the moon. And that's where the ayah says, اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّاعَةِ وَانْشَقَّ الْقَمَرِ وَإِنْ يَرَوْ آيَةً يُعْرِضُ وَيَقُولُ سِحْرٌ مُسْتَمِرٌ So he split the moon. Another miracle we came with is the Quran that we have. And the Quran, the Quran is one of the strongest, the most strongest proof and evidence that he came with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you have to understand something. Every prophet, the miracle that they came with, it died with them. Like in Nabi Lai Muhammad, his miracle still today stays. Every prophet came with a miracle, and every prophet's miracle went with him. Like it all went. Except who? Except Nabi Lai Muhammad. His miracle still stays. Until the Day of Judgment, it's going to stay, which is the Quran. This Quran. It's either poetry or it's not. Mm. And you know what's amazing is that the Quran came out into a people who reached the pinnacle of eloquency. Every nation, whatever they were good at, the Prophet was given that. Nabi Lai Musa, his people were magicians. So the Prophet was given something to counter that magic, which was a mu'jiza. Nabi Lai Musa was given the stick. <coughs> Isa, the people reached medicine. And that's what they were into. And so what was he doing? He passed them in that. He was bringing people out of the dead. You know, with the, with the permission of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Arabs, they were eloquent. They reached the pinnacle of speech and eloquency and the ability to articulate their words. And so Allah wa Ta'ala gave Nabi Muhammad the Quran. This Quran. And this Quran was not, it was not poetry. And that's what even shocked them. The eloquency and it wasn't poetry. Hmm. I want to give you an example of a man who knew poetry. He was one of the greatest poets. His name is called Unais al-Ghifari. He's a brother of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. He's his brother. He knew poetry. He was a master of poetry. He was one of the senior poets. So he said, لَقَدْ سَمِعْتُ قَوْلَ الْكَهَنَةِ I heard the speech of the fortune tellers. I've heard them. فَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِهِمْ This man's speech is not the speech of a kahin, a fortune teller or a magician. No, it's not. And I've placed his speech next to the speech of the poets. Ah. For wallahi, by Allah, I swear, his speech doesn't go in line with the speech of the poets. Hmm. It's nothing like the poetry. Allahi Muhammad is truthful وَإِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ And they are lying about him by what they are saying. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala cleared that all for them. He said, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرْ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ تَنْزِيلٌ مِّنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ In another ayah, Allah said, وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ وَقُرْآنُ مُبِينٌ it wasn't poetry. I'd like to do a separate episode, I think, on the Quran itself and wh- why it's a miracle exactly. Uh, what is the next point that you'd like to bring after that? Another exa- another proof to show that he was a prophet sent from Allah Azza wa Jalla is the fact that he was, uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the times that he needed, he needed the revelation, he needed support. Nothing was coming to him for a period of time, and this helps us because if it was all coming from him. Sallallahu mm. alayhi Before I go into this point, I really want, I, there was a point I just wanted to mention. Sure. The scholars, they were, sh- this is one of the things that really showed he, his, the truthfulness of the Quran that he came with. If you compare the speech that he came with, how can it all quickly change into this eloquency? And then when he spoke, it was slightly different to it. And the mm. rhythm and everything was different. It shows you th- they were coming from two different. One okay. was from him, and the other one was from who? Allah Azza wa Jalla. And we're talking about the wording here, not the legislation. Yes. The Quran, when he read it, it was just—it was a way. It was—it was—it was in a pattern. It was in a—it it was in a particular structure and amazing. But when you look at the the uh, his own speech, his own eloquence and his own—it just never reached the Quran. 
coming back to so sorry just before we move on because I think it's probably appropriate to bring here there is an alternative doubt that some people bring and that is like you mentioned it's clear that the Quran was different to his normal speech so he was clearly not getting it from himself fine some people say we agree with that but why do you believe it came from Allah why couldn't it have come from the devil for example so some people say and there are some things known as the, sa- the satanic verses mm-hmm. and it's mentioned in Tariq al-Tabri mm-hmm. where he talks about an incident where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually was believed or mentioned that the, he was revealed ayat from shaitan from the satan what so do you have to say about this so the issue of the qissa to al-gharaniq um the scholars they prove the, the weakness of it um uh, so that is fabricated it's no basis to it that's a simple answer without going into too much details it's weak it has no basis there's no evidence for it and rather allah wa ta'ala he tells us the relationship between the Prophet and the Shaytan. I'll give you an example. Allah says, قُلْ هَلْ أُنَبِّئُكُمْ عَلَى مَنْ تَنَزَّلُ الشَّيَاطِينَ تَنَزَّلُ عَلَى كُلِّ أَفَّاكٍ أَثِيمٍ يُلْقُونَ السَّمْعَ وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ كَاذِبُونَ The Shayateen, they only descend on a liar. And I just proved to you the Prophet is not a liar. Because the ayah, what did he say? تَنَزَّلُ عَلَى كُلِّ أَفَّاكٍ أَثِيمٍ It comes down on every affak, a forgered, a person who lies and fabricates things. You see. And the ayah, وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ كَاذِبُونَ The overwhelming majority of them are liars. And Ibn Muhammad wasn't a liar. So shaytan, the Quran said that there was no shaytan in relation with him. Coming back to the other point, which is the تَأْخِيرُ نُزُولُ Quran, That the Quran delayed from him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when there was need for it. Let me give you an example of the issue of hadithatul ifki. When the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his wife was accused of zina. This is his wife. This is his honor, alayhi salatu wasalam. If it was all coming from him, and we all know when something happens to you personally, you like to react fast and quick. You want to get an answer. For one month, he had no answer. Hmm. The hadith mentions Aisha said, وَقَدْ مَكَثَ شَهْرًا He stayed for a month. لا يوحى إليه No revelation was coming down on him. في شأني, في شأني شيء Regarding my affairs, there was nothing that was coming down on him. So he had nothing to say to her. For a whole entire month, he didn't. Another example is the issue of the turning away from the Qibla. Allah says, He was looking at the sky because he wanted to turn away from Beit al-Maqdis. Mm-hmm. Okay? And he wanted, because he was turned away from Mecca for a period of time. And he wanted to go back to Mecca and face Mecca to pray. And so he kept looking at the sky. Why is he looking at the sky? Why doesn't he just give the answer and say, I'm turning away from it? Say that this is from who Allah is. Okay. And many other examples, the Sulh al the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and how it all happened. All of it was a revelation. He was, wait, let's wait, let's do this. And see, to be honest, Nebulai Muhammad had the wisest people around him. Hmm. He had Abu Sufyan, the leader of Quraysh, Abu Bakr, had a position in Quraysh. These people could see through a liar, a fabricator, a fraudster. A charlatan, they could clearly see and they'll say, look, you, you don't, don't play around with our minds. What if we look at some of the... Um, what if we look at some of the things that he came with that we know was different to the legislation? There's an argument that's out there and I think it's worth mentioning that he actually lied for personal gain. He wanted wealth, he wanted power, he wanted fame, he wanted women. And one of the things that they bring specifically with this regard is that we know in our religion you're allowed a maximum of four wives. Mm-hmm. Yet he had more than this. So he's actually breaking the rules for his own personal gain. What do you have to say about that? If Nabila Muhammad wanted women, at the beginning of his message, Quraysh presented that to him. They said to him, if you want money, we'll give it to you. If you're looking for fame, we're going to give it to you. If you're looking for women, you want whatever you're looking, we'll give it to you. Just stop this and just help us. Don't, dis- uni- don't split us. Don't split our ranks. Quraysh clearly said that to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, anyone who looks at the Prophet's history will realize he didn't gain no money. And he lived a very poor life, alayhi salatu wasalam. Anyone who looks at the Prophet's life, alayhi salatu wasalam, was, he was shunned by his community. They made him leave Mecca. He turned his back to Mecca. or he turned Before he left Mecca to Medina, he turned and looked at Mecca. And he said, Mecca, I love you. And if it wasn't for my people, I would never have left you. He left his own hometown. This doesn't go in, the, in line psychological, psychologically. 
uh, in accordance to a person who's looking for fame. Rather, he got everything else done to him. His sahabas were killed. His followers were killed. As for the concept of marriage, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I said to you, there were things that were obligated on him, made mandatory on him to do that we would find hard if we were told to do it. So why is it that we don't look at that as well? Okay, any more evidence or any more general arguments that you wanted to bring? Last but not least is my uh, evidence would be Dalalat Itab in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet was scolded by Allah Azza wa Jalla on many different occasions in the Quran. He was scolded, he was told off in things that he did. Let me give you about three examples, and there, there, there are more than that. Okay. The f- first one is um, when he, the, the qadiyya and the issue related to Zainab, Zainab bint Jahsh, who was the wife of uh, Zayd ibn Harith. You see, Zayd ibn Harith, the Prophet, took him like his own son, and he tried to attribute himself to uh, Zayd and tried to say, You are called Zayd ibn Muhammad. And Allah wa ta'ala, he said, uh, the ayah that came down. Call your, call your, attribute yourself to your, your fathers only. Mm-hmm. Now, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Zainab bin Tijahsh and Zayd ibn Harith went their separate ways and broke up. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was informed that it will be written for him to get married to Zainab. And he, he felt shy. He, very, he felt very, very shy regarding that and he didn't want to talk about it. And Aisha said, look what she said, وَلَوْ كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ صلى الله عليه وسلم. If the Prophet وسلم, was كَاتِمَ شَيْئًا If he would have ever concealed a verse in the Quran, مِمَّا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ لَكَتَمَ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ He would have concealed this verse. Which verse is he talking about? وَإِذْ تَقُولُ لِلَّذِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكَ وَاتَّقِ اللَّهَ وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَ اللَّهُ مُبْدِيهِ وَتَخْشَى النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ حَقُّ أَن تَخْشَى فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا لِكَيْ لَا يَكُونَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَجٌ فِي أَزْوَاجِ أَدْعِيَاهِمْ إِذَا قَضَوْا مِنْهُنَّ وَطَرًا وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدَرًا مَفْعُولًا If he would have ever, ever concealed something, he would have concealed that verse. The, what does that verse tell him? That, are you scared of the people? Are you not scared of Allah? Are you scared of them? Allah is the one that you should be scared of. Like, tell the people that Zayd is going to be your wife. Don't be scared of it. Another example is when he asked forgiveness for his uncle. And Allah wa ta'ala scolded him for that. He said, Ma kana nabi, It is not befitting for a prophet. Walladina amanu, and those who believe, Ayastaghfiru lil mushrikeen walau kanu uri qurba min ba'di ma tabayyana lahum. It is not befitting for a prophet and the believers to ask forgiveness for the disbelievers mm-hmm. after they've died upon that state. Also, the booty that they took from the Battle of Badr that the Prophet, وسلم, the 70 booty that they took, spoils of war. The Prophet said he used it. He got told off for doing that. He utilized it by s- trying to s- take it back to the people of Quraysh to get money from it. And Allah wa ta'ala said, مَا كَانَ لِلْنَبِيِّ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ أَثْرًا حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ تُرِيدُونَ عَرَضَ الدُّنْيَا وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ You see, it's not befitting for a prophet to have captives and try to make money out of it. Do you want the dunya? And Allah wants the akhirah. So your argument is that because he was rebuked, it shows that they couldn't, no, nobody would rebuke themselves openly and publicly. Exactly. Nobody would want that. No one would make shame themselves and show themselves to be in, in, the, in, in the wrong. Especially at a time when you're, you have the whole region, you have the whole uh, Arabian, everybody is coming to you and taking, religion, taking their faith and they're believing in you. It doesn't make sense to show them that you do mistakes. Okay, and I think you, you might have touched on it just now when you're talking about his message being coherent and making sense. One of the other questions that some people say is that, okay, you've proved that he, was a li- he wasn't a liar. He was truthful. I'm with you on that. But what if he, he genuinely believed he was receiving revelation, but he was just deluded? The concept of being deluded, and it, it's, it's a mental health issue. That cannot be, it's not consistent with his biography, sallallahu alayhi wa the way that he prepared his army, the way he controlled and he ran his private affairs, the way he ran the public affairs. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the way his, the, his physical, a bit, a physical pain that he went through when he, revelation came down on him, all of that does not go in line with his biography, alayhi wa sallam. What about certain things in his biography that might appear to be strange? Do you genuinely believe that he flew on a winged horse into the seven heavens? I mean, surely that seems like to be a delusion. That somebody so that someone will go to the seven heavens. Yeah, he's he's claiming that this is what this is what he did. It it's be- unlike the previous miracles, like when Musa alayhi spit the 
Red Sea opened, he had witnesses. Mm -hmm. When Isa says, a.s. brought people back from the dead, he had, but with the permission of Allah, he had witnesses. Uh -huh. Whereas this is one man claiming that he went on a night journey to the seven heavens with no other witnesses. Is, does this not sound like delusion to you? Do you genuinely believe this happened? Of course I believe it happened. Uh, let me explain something to you. Again, that being said goes in the context of who he is. His life, his biography. This man has never lied before. There was no accusation prior to Islam, before he became a prophet. No one accused him of him. No one accused him of being mentally deranged. No one did, or had any mental health I issues. Not to mention the, the sorry, people didn't claim he was possessed before he became a prophet. Not before, so afterwards. Uh, I mean, uh, but this they, happened afterwards. After Islam, they said that because they had they 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 had their reasons because they they. They had adversaries to him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They are against him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so they would say anything that they could accuse him of, or uh, you know, they can throw at, uh, they can throw him at. But do you think a deranged lunatic, for example, could come up with all of these points that I mentioned? For example, he mentioned some scientific things that are proven today to be scientific. The concept of embryology, for example, when he spoke about it in the Quran, خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ ثُمَّ جَعَلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا وَأَنْزَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَنْعَامِ ثَمَانِيَةَ أَزْوَاجٍ يَخْلُقُكُمْ فِي بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ خَلْقًا مِنْ بَعْدِ خَلْقٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتٍ ثَلَاثٍ ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمْ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ فَأَنَّا تُصْرَفُونَ he spoke about the sensory and where the pain comes from. If you get burnt, scientists have now proven that the pain comes from the skin, mm. and it's the skin that feels the pain. And it's the warmth. The Prophet ﷺ said in the ayah, "Inna ladina kafaru bi ayatina sawfa nuslihim nara kullama nadijat juluduhum badalnahum juludan ghayrah liyadukul adab." Inna Allah kana azizan hakima. So this, all of these can't come from a deranged man. He's bringing facts to the table. He's bringing things that are, uh, you know, mind-boggling. It's 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 it shocked shook shocked the world. Do you believe that there's going to be another prophet after him? No. Allah Why told not? us in the Quran, "Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadi min rijalikum, walakin Rasul Allah wa khatam al nabiyin." He's the final and last prophet. So, because I believe him is truthful, and I believed him in everything else, and his biography, and the f the things that he's brought to the table, I definitely believe there will never come a prophet after him. At the start of this podcast, you mentioned that one of the reasons why Allah sends prophets is to show mankind how to live their lives. We know that there are always new things coming up in the modern day world. There are always new things. Do we not need clarif clarification from Allah on how to deal with these new things? Allah has already done that for us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given us the way forward for every single thing that we need. Uh, nothing has been left. It's everything has been given to us and it's being explained to us. You're right. The Quran doesn't talk about the uh, uh, you know, detailed issues like that. And that's why we believe there are general principles in the Quran. That there is never going to come anything in the future except that um, it's been explained for us. But in what way, Lakin? In details? Case by case? No. General principles were given. And those general principles, they apply till the day of judgment. So for example, at the time of the Messenger of Islam, alcohol was prohibited. And now drugs have come. And then other types of substances have come that intoxicate the mind. And that's it. We'll just we'll keep bringing it back to the alcohol. Come, you know, bring it back to that. Okay. Before we wrap up this episode, can you just give us a summary of your main points and your main arguments? So first of all, dealing with the concept of prophethood and why it's even possible in the first place. So I, I, I mentioned five, and that was that Allah created. It's called the Dalilu, Dalilu al Khalqi wal Qudrati wa Qiyas al Aula. Allah created Subhanahu wa Taala, and Allah Tabarak wa Taala, He has the ability, and it's more befitting for Allah Azza wa Jalla to create and to also uh, command His creation. The second one is Al Inayat wal Hikma. It's the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jalla that He would. Create a creation and he'll command them and he'll prohibit them. Number three is الضرورت والحاجة والافتقار That the creation is in need of Allah Azza wa Jalla to know their creator. Who is he? Where is he? The creation are in need of that. Number four is العدل الإلهي Allah's ultimate justice. That he brings us and sends us a messenger who will clarify everything to us or else 
will come the day of judgment, we'll get punished and we didn't have a messenger sent to us, that doesn't go in line with Allah's justice, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fifth one is, Dalilul istiqra'i tarikhi. Historically, prophets came. So that's a fact. It's a brute fact. After I've proven the rational evidence of Nabila Muhammad, uh, sorry, of the, of the plausibility of being a prophet, Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, before I move on to the other point I want to say that the aql The rational uh, plausibility I mean the, the aql itself And I think we should make a podcast on that as well The relationship between reason and faith But the aql As the poet Ibn al-Qayyim said He said لا يستقل العقل دون هداية بالوحي تأصيلا ولا تفصيلا كالطرف دون النور ليس بمدرك حتى يراه بكرة وأصيلا وإذا النبوة لم ينلك ضياؤها فالعقل لا يهديك قط سبيلا نور النبوة مثل نور الشمس للعين البصيرة فاتخذه دليلا طرق الهدى مزدودة إلا على من أم هذا الوحي والتنزيلا فإذا عدلت عن الطريق تعمدا فاعلم بأنك ما أردت وصولا يا طالبا درك الهدى بالعقل دون النقل لن تلقى لذاك دليلا What many people don't understand is that the aql is, is, is got a place in our religion but the aql is like the eye. Your eye. Mm-hmm. Your eye can see, but it leads light to see. You have to put the light on, then you can see. The l- eyes by itself can't see. The aql by itself cannot see. It needs light. And the light is the revelation. And we'll talk about that in more details, inshallah ta'ala, uh, when we speak about the uh, re- relationship between reason and, uh, and, and faith. But that was my five uh, aql uh, evidences of the plausibility of a prophet. Okay. Then I mention seven uh, evidences that Nabi Muhammad is a prophet sent from Allah. The first one is ittisaf Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam bil kamal al akhlaqi that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam had the utmost moral conduct. And I only mentioned one of that which is truthfulness. The second one I mentioned was dalalatul ummiyah. Dalalatul ummiyah that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was he was ummi. He was illiterate. The third one was Kamal Tashiri'i, the complete legislation that he came with, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and how complete this religion was. I mentioned that, and I talked about it from the two angles of Fitriya to Tadayun and Fitriya to Tahsin wa Taqbih. That everyone, there's an innate ability built inside us to want to be religious and to connect ourselves to Allah Azza wa And it's also built inside us to want to know what is good from what is bad, and we can't know every good and bad unless we have religion. Um, I also spoke about um, the fact that he told us of the unseen. Iktharun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min al-akhbari bil ghuyubi that he talked about the future that is going to happen. And many of them he prophesied there and he was, he was right alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he also told us about the past. Salawatullahi wa sallamu alayhi. I also mentioned the Quran and how that was a miracle that he came with alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sixth one was um, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was scolded by Allah azza wa jalla and how he was told off and I gave about three examples for that and last but not least I spoke about that the Quran would, was delayed in coming down when, they, when, when the need was really there for him he really needed it okay just to wrap up what is your advice for somebody who doesn't accept Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the final prophet they believe in all of the other prophets but they don't accept Muhammad what is your advice for these kind of people does he believe in Jesus? Yes. Well then, Isa ibn Maryam already told us of Nabilah Muhammad coming. And that's one of the evidences of his prophecy as well. That Nabilah Isa told us that Nabilah Muhammad is going to come. And that itself is in the Bible. And Allah knows best, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khairan, Ustad Abdul Rahman, uh, once again joining me on this podcast. That's all we have time for for now. Subhanakal wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha la anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. I hope you enjoyed and benefited from that discussion. Please do share it with your friends and family members if you feel like they might benefit too. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button below so you're notified of any new episodes. Check out www.thehotseatpodcast.com. That's thehotseatpodcast.com. On there, you'll find a little bit more information about the podcast and you'll also have the chance to vote for which topic you'd like to see discussed on the show. You can also ask questions on the website to the speaker himself about these contemporary modern day issues. Until next time, fi imalillahi wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.